I love teaching Kepler's laws. These are really cool. So Kepler lived from 1571 to 1630, and he did a lot in his lifetime. He improved Nicholas Copernicus's heliocentric theory, which is the theory that all of the planets orbit around the sun and not the Earth. He fit Tycho Brahe's observational data to mathematical models. They had a very interesting um, working relationship and it may involve murder, I don't know. And he inspired Newton's theory of universal gravitation. So Kepler, in his time working for Tycho Brahe, used a bunch of information, a lot of observational data, but he was a very good mathematician, and he figured out that first, that every planet, or that every planet's orbit is an ellipse, not a circle, with the sun, at one of its focus points. So you'll notice here that I drew Earth's orbit around the sun as an ellipse, not as a perfect circle. So an ellipse is, um, basically imagine that you could tie a string and you would go around those two points, kind of like each point is a pushpin and you can draw, a, well try to draw a circle around it, but because the string is bound by two points, it doesn't go as far here or here as it can out here. Um, so that's what an ellipse is, kind of like a football shape. Now, if the two foci are close together, then you get a nearly circular orbit. So close foci or focal points, that will give you a nearly circular orbit. And that is the case with the planets. Their foci are fairly close together in relation to how far they actually orbit. Now, if you have far foci, or focal points that are far from each other, you're gonna have this elongated ellipse, and that would be something like for um, comets. So I'll just add here, planets tend to have more circular orbits. They're not perfectly circular, but pretty close. So for our Earth in particular, the foci are at the center of the sun, and actually the foci are so close together, the other focal point is still within the sun, which is kind of neat. Um, and then this allows Earth to have that elliptical but nearly circular orbit, which is nice when we're doing any sort of um, like approximations, we can approximate a circle. So Earth's orbit is elliptical but nearly circular. as both focal points are within the sun. And it's important to remember that the sun is really huge, much larger than any of the planets. It has 98% of the mass of the solar system within that one object. So that is Kepler's first law that we're dealing with ellipses. Kepler's second law is an interesting one. The line that joins the sun and the planet sweeps, sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time. So what that's really saying is if Earth traveled from this point to this point, the line would sweep out this shaded area in time, we'll call that T1. So it sweeps out this area A1 in time T1. Over here, when it's going through another part of it, its orbit, that could be a delta T2, and it would sweep out this area, A2. What New or sorry, Kepler's second law is stating Kepler's second law says that if those times are equal, then the areas are equal to. And there's mathematical models to prove this, but that really is more for math class and less for what we need right now.
we really need Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law is also very mathematical, but it's really robust and we can use it. It says the square of the orbital period, that's the time it takes to do one orbit, is proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. And it took Kepler using some pretty complex observational data and knowing a lot of math to combine these two ideas, the math and the observational data, to find the relationship between the period and the radius. So we can express this as an equation, but first let's express this as a proportionality. So the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. Well, that means that if we were to multiply or divide these, there should be a constant value for the, um, the quotient or the product. We take the quotient and we call it Kepler's constant. So this Kepler's constant is equal to the orbital period squared Orbital period, of course, is measured in the standard SI unit second. And divide it by the orbital radius cubed. And now orbital radius will be measured in meters, of course. So the units here for Kepler's constant is going to be seconds, seconds squared over meters cubed. I'm going to write that nicer. Seconds squared over meters cubed. And this constant will be true for each, um, each object that's orbiting a central object. So to explain that in a different way, we have a Kepler's constant for the Sun that says the orbital period squared of Mercury divided by its cubed of the orbital radius gives a value. So we take the numbers for Mercury and we get this value. We take the values for Venus t squared over r cubed, divide them, we get Kepler's constant, that same value. For Earth, Earth's orbital period divided by its um, orbital radius cubed, sorry, orbital period squared divided by its orbital radius cubed, will give that same value. So each time you take any planet that's orbiting the Sun's orbital period, square it, divided by its orbital radius, cube it, you get the exact same value here. Now you can do this for other objects that are being orbited. For example, you could find the Kepler's constant for Earth. It's going to have a different value than that of the Sun. You can find the Kepler's constant for Jupiter using all of Jupiter's moons. And you'll get the same value each time you use the same, each time you're talking about the same object like Jupiter and the things that orbit it. But the constant values for the Sun, for Jupiter, for the Earth will all be different and we'll explore that in a little bit in the next video.